Okay, so let's start, I guess. Ratnani is not yet. I guess the introduction is not yet. Yeah, it's already. Yeah, and I have to really leave at four today. Um. Okay. Oh, our visitors are back. Yes. <laughs> Where is Otama? So now he's not back. Or in the ground. Special player, flown in from Nita. Can I have a little bit of one? Yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, Joel, I tell you. I'm going to go to the class. Okay, so um, presidency and Jadavpur is often mentioned in the same breath. But we always, uh, in, in our colloquial series, we often lament that we don't have enough speakers from Jadavpur. Uh, so today it's our great pleasure to have uh, Professor Shaurabh Bhattacharya from Jadavpur University. Uh, like uh, many of our speakers, Shaurabh is an undergrad from the Erstwhile Presidency College. Then he did his master from Rajavaja Science College and PhD from the SNBOS Center uh, uh, with uh, Professor Amitabh Lahiri, who is again uh, sort of a friend of the school, and now that SN Bos and us have a more, we all and he is the dean there, so we always have various discussions. And, um, also, and also an alumnus of the And then from after his PhD, showed up, uh, went to HRI for a postdoc, and then to Creek Center for Theoretical Physics uh, for a second stint of postdoc, then came back to India and did a short stint at Ayuka as a postdoc, where again we have members uh, who were <laughs> part of Ayuka before. And then after that, he joined IIT Ropa as a faculty member. And he was there till 2022. And then in mid 2022, he came back to uh, Kolkata. Uh, you know, who can resist the, the, the allure of Kolkata? Uh, so he came back and joined the faculty of Jadavpur University, uh, where uh, he has joined our former colleagues, uh, Kanan Kumar Dutta and uh, Rundar Um Okay, so, uh, and so today Shobra will talk about his uh, work on primordial cosmic inflation. Uh, so without further delay. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Professor uh, Rituman Chatterjee, uh, I'd first like to thank you for uh, inviting me, for the kind invitation and uh, for the kind introduction. So, and also it is a great pleasure and certainly, I mean, it is a great pleasure and privilege to be here. I mean, uh, things have changed here, I can see, as I was discussing. Uh, I mean, uh, outlook-wise, uh, uh, actually, I did my undergraduation from here, from 2000 to 2003, and I used to live here in Hindustan. I don't know if there is somebody who lived. The one who well, the one who so in is in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I know this place very well, this whole area. Uh, so anyway, um, so let's uh, begin uh, here today. So today I'll be talking about loops in primordial cosmic inflation. So uh, first I should uh, tell you that uh, this is a little bit technical things, okay. Um, but the thing is that there might, you might encounter, you encounter mathematical expressions. You might ignore them if you do not like them. Okay, uh, however, I would, uh, I would try to give you uh, the basic uh, uh, essence of uh, these things and uh, most importantly, I will, I, I will try to convey that why uh, one should be interested in this kind of uh, stuffs, in this kind of calculations, and why they are, uh, they can be important, in what context uh, they can be important. So, yeah, so let us begin then. Maybe just keep there. Yeah. So, uh, so. Perhaps all of us, uh, all of you know, 
that our universe is not static. Okay, it is expanding, right? Uh, it is time dependent. That means if you focus your telescope to large enough distance, distances which are more than 300 million uh, light years, you will see that the universe looks very spatially homogeneous and isotropic at uh, large scales. And the universe is also expanding. It is time dependent. So uh, it is the homogeneity, the spatial homogeneity and isotropy of our universe is uh, so accurate observationally uh, that uh, it, this led to a question that how two portions of the sky which are far uh, separated nowadays uh, look so much identical, right? When I say so much identical, I mean the distribution of galaxies, the distribution of this cosmic microwave background. Okay, this is some kind of primordial radiation. Uh, and that led to the conjecture of the primordial cosmic inflation. It said that the universe started, uh, I mean, from a very small scale, uh, long time back, its time scale is 14 billion years. And then it underwent, our very early universe, underwent a very uh, rapid phase of accelerated expansion. This is called the cosmic inflation or the primordial cosmic inflation, so that the patches which we look today, which are which, which appear to be very largely separated, they were in causal contact at some early times. And later on, they got causally separated due to this enormous cosmic inflation. Now, this kind of accelerated expansion, I would try to, I would, I would, I would, I would try to quantify what is meant by, um, what is meant by accelerated expansion uh, later on a little bit. Uh, however, this, uh, uh, accelerated expansion actually uh, actually requires some kind of exotic matter which has positive energy density but negative isotropic pressure and that kind of exotic matter is called the dark energy. The simplest form of this dark energy is the cosmologic, is a cosmological constant, a positive cosmological constant. Uh, inflation actually also explains the flatness problem and the non-observed flatness problem of our universe means the spatial section of our universe at very large scales appears to be flat to be. Um, and the non-observed uh, defects, non-observed objects like the magnetic monopoles. I mean, uh, often it is said that the magnetic monopoles do not exist in nature, but that is not a correct statement. Magnetic monopoles might exist in nature, even today, if some new energy scale uh, is uh, observed, I mean, it, it, it is possible that we can explore particle physics in some new energy scales which will look also for magnetic moons along with other particles. Anyway, so there are some open issues uh, associated with this primordial cosmic inflation. First question is, starting from the early inflationary high density dark energy, so the uh, stage of inflation, it is, sub, it is, I mean, it is natural to take the dark energy density or the value of this cosmological constant to be rather high. And uh, however, nowadays, uh, its observed value, the lambda's cosmological constant's value, appears to be very uh, small. So the question is, starting from the early inflationary high density dark energy, how did we reach its current time value? Can quantum effects explain this thing? How did the inflation aid to begin the radiation-dominated or thermalized era? There has been lots of researches going on, on these things, but a clear picturization of these things or clear mechanism of these things are hitherto missing. How did the inflationary cosmological quantum perturbations become classical to develop into the large-scale structures we observe today? During the inflation, it is believed that there are fluctuations which are quantum field theoretical. Right. And these fluctuations grew with time and later on they became classical. They, they found the seed of the large scale structures, that is the galaxies, cluster of galaxies we observe today. So these quantum field theoretic perturbations, quantum perturbations grew with time and they became classical. A galaxy is a classical object, large thing. So the question is how these things 
became classical. This is called the uh, decoherence problem. And um, is lambda, the cosmological constant, a really vacuum energy density? And how did the primordial magnetic field generate? This is also an interesting problem. It is called the galactic dynamo problem. Uh, I mean, if you look into the intergalactic spaces, it turns out that there, there is, I mean, high value of magnetic fields that has been observed. But there has been no satisfactory theoretical explanations behind uh, such observation. It is believed that, uh, I mean, such, such uh, high value of the magnetic field in the intergalactic uh, places would have something to do with the primordial inflationary area. But this is still an open question. This is uh, this galactic dynamic. Yeah, so this is the um, figure, a uh, cartoon diagram of our universe. It's published by NASA. I'm sure many of you have seen this earlier. So this is the beginning of our universe with a Big Bang. Nobody knows what is a Big Bang or, I mean, what was before it. But after Big Bang, so this surface is the uh, universe, actually, the, uh, where we live. This is the present. Here we live now, right now. And after, before 14 billion years ago, uh, before 14 billion, 14 billion years ago, actually, uh, the universe started. And you can see the slope of this uh, hyperboloid kind of stuff. And it's uh, rapid accelerated expansion here. This is the era of uh, primordial cosmic inflation. This uh, green blue surface is called uh, the surface of last scattering. It appeared, uh, it happened after the inflation. And this is very interesting. Actually, this is the first light uh, we can see from our universe. Before this uh, surface of last scattering, um, we could not see. Light cannot prove our early universe. It was opaque. Only gravitational radiations can come for the early universe. There are mechanisms behind it, perhaps you already know, but I will not go into the discussions of it. And here we leave again. So after this uh, inflation, we entered very briefly something called the radiation dominated era. And after that, we entered an era called cold dark matter domination, where the structures started to develop. And first generation galaxy stars they started to form. And the uh, matter domination continued for a long time. And where, I mean, these uh, stars and galaxies form, many of the stars actually, I mean, it is interesting to note, many of the stars actually formed in this period and they exploded due to some mechanism called supernova explosion. And they contained carbon, and carbon got spread into the whole intergalactic space. And carbon, you know, without carbon, there cannot be any life formation. So, and then after, uh, I mean, after a long time, the universe again started uh, expanding with acceleration. At least that's what the current observation says. And it led to the Nobel Prize in physics in uh, 2011. Yeah, by to two uh, astronomers, Rice and Paul Mutter. And it also says the universe, the current universe where we live, is also dominated by dark energy or cosmological constant. Earlier, during this primordial inflation, I'm interested in this period. Uh, the, as you can see, the slope is very high. So the expansion rate was very high compared to uh, our current uh, time. And uh, so that's what is the uh, uh, one is the one question I was talking about. So the uh, primordial value of the dark energy or the cosmological constant, quote unquote constant, must have been very high uh, uh, during the early universe compared to what is observed today. So what is the mechanism? How did it become uh, so small? <laughs> So let us elaborate on this problem a little bit. It is known as the cos cosmic coincidence problem. It turns out that the current observed value of cosmological constant, tiny value, if it is, if there is only around plus minus 10% of mismatch, then our, uh, our uh, universe 
would have been uh, looked very different. For example, the cosmological constant or the dark energy, as I said, it, it creates accelerated expansion. That is a repulsive effect. And it stops structure formation. So what we observed today, Lander's value, cosmological constant's value, if it was higher than 10%, uh, only 10%, compared to what we are observing it today, most of the galaxies, what we see today, would not have come, right? We would not have existed. And if it was only about 10% less than what is uh, observed today, uh, I mean, the universe would have looked very old. I mean, there is a process called virialization of galaxies. Most of the galaxies would have been virialized and things would have looked very different. So this is a puzzling question. Then this is just a coincidence, or there is uh, some deep mechanism. Often, which appears to be a, I mean, kind of, uh, kind of cancellation, a kind of fine tuning in physics, uh, has some kind of underlying, underlying mechanism, microscopic mechanism in physics. Always, almost always. So a classical slow roll potential. So the question is, how did the inflationary dark energy density <coughs> or the cosmological value of the cosmological constant became so small today. This is known as the cosmic coincidence puzzle. I mean, a classical slow roll potential, one might assume that there is a potential, it drops into uh, uh, minima, and that's how we might reduce, um, reduce the value of the cosmological constant, the dark energy density, but it doesn't work because uh, they ignore actually quantum effects, which might be uh, very dominating in time-dependent background. Anyway, let's proceed. Here is uh, something called the de Sitter universe. So this actually is a very popular model, space-time model of, uh, I mean, if you are familiar with metric, then it's fine. If you are not, you can just ignore it. What it says, this, this equation uh, represents, it, it actually represents the uh, geometry, the structure of our early universe during primordial inflation. This is a model, but this is a very well-motivated model. Now you can see there is a function a of t here. It is, uh, I mean, in, it, is called, uh, it is called a scale factor. And actually it is expanding with time. This t, little t is the cosmological time. With capital H is called the Hubble rate, and this is related to the cosmological constant lambda like this. So Hubble rate is a constant in the Sitter universe. And um, this H inverse is called the Hubble or cosmological event horizon. This is a restriction of uh, how much we can see in our universe. Um, and popularly, most popularly, uh, this matrix is taken as uh, the metric during inflation. However, there can be variance or the generalizations of it, but uh, this is the simplest one and extremely well motivated because of its high degree of symmetry. There are 10 symmetries in this metric, just like the flat space time, but uh, let's not go into that detail. And here is a little bit of detail about how accelerated expansion occurs. Uh, here is the Einstein's equation perhaps you, most of you know already. Uh, this capital G mu nu is called the Einstein tensor. That represents the space-time geometry, the space-time structure. And that is derived from the matrix, right? Matrix represents the length scale. I mean, the length interval or the space intervals, how it changes. In our usual day-to-day -day universe, the day-to-day -day life, the length intervals or the space intervals do not change. However, if you are talking about strong gravity regime, like our early universe, or if you go to go close to some black holes or high gravity regime, your length intervals and your time intervals might change with time. And they might look different if you go from one place to other place. That's why there is the necessity of this matrix. This capital T meaning, actually, it is called the energy momentum tensor, and it represents the matter distribution. So in special relativity, we have learned about mass and energy equivalence. In general relativity, we, we learn about the equivalence between the space time and mass and energy. So, so it turns out, this is the metric 
of in cosmology. If you, if you, as I said, if you look into the look into very large scale, uh, the universe looks like this. This is the geometry, and if you set a of t equal to one, then your matrix is the usual matrix of the special relativity. And um, it turns out that uh, the Einstein equation uh, <laughs> indicates that uh, this scale factor. This function of a of t is called the scale factor, satisfies these two equations. Rho is the energy density of matter, and capital P is the pressure of the matter. So this equation, I mean, as you can see here, the first equation, it says that if rho is positive, energy density is positive, of course it is intuitive, then a dot square over a square dot denotes time derivative. Uh, is positive greater than zero, and that means actually the universe is expanding. If a of t is expanding, that means this length scale, d square plus d y square plus d z square, is also expanding, right? And this is a double derivative of the scale factor, and this is this shows something very interesting. If a dot is positive, it shows the universe is expanding, which is possible if rho is taken to be positive, which is always the case for physically reasonable matter fields. And here there is a combination of rho plus three times p. Now, if I want to have accelerated expansion, that means the universe is not only expanding, but also it is expanding with some accelerated rate. The rate of expansion is also increasing. Then this rho plus three p must be actually negative. You see this negative sign. Rho is positive, rho plus 3p is negative, so it is only possible if p is negative, right? And in fact, rho plus 3p is less than zero. All such matter actually called this dark energy collectively, and if I uh, take, this is the equation of mon equation of state, p is w times rho. If I take w equal to minus one, it turns out that this rho and p becomes a constant, and this celebrated constant is called the cosmological constant, lambda. This lambda actually uh, was first introduced by Einstein in a very different context. Here we are talking about accelerated expansion of our universe, but Einstein introduced capital lambda, cosmological constant, just to make the universe fully static. Maybe in your general relativity course, you have already encountered this, or maybe you'll encounter it later. Uh, and that's why, I mean, when Hubble's discovery proved that our universe is not static or time independent, he said that throw this away, throw this constant away, this is the biggest blunder of mine. But later on, this lambda became very relevant, but for a different, very different purpose compared to Einstein's, that lambda was used to explain the accelerated expansion of our universe in place of, instead of explaining why the universe is static, which is not the case. Anyway, let's proceed. Here I have uh, kept this cartoon. My source is Google. Um, I mean, uh, see what is the expansion of our universe? I mean, you might ask how do we know the universe is expanding? And that is a standard test in cosmology, observation in cosmology, and that is called redshift. Okay. Distant stars actually emit hydrogen lines. And let's say, let us imagine a balloon is being blown by injecting air into it. And let's say that there is a photon traveling from here to here. And this is the sinusoidal wave targeting its light. <coughs> so if it is expanding like this, as you can see, since the surface is expanding, its wavelength is getting stressed. In other words, it is getting redshift. So if there is a distant star and let's say a, uh, some hydrogen uh, atoms uh, spectrum, some line is, uh, photon is emitted from there, from the surface of the star, by the time photon reaches uh, Earth, our telescope, its wavelength gets stretched due to the expansion of our universe. And it turns out, if you now measure the wavelength of that photon, it will turn out that its wavelength is less compared to what it should have been. For example, you know all about uh, this spectrum of hydrogen atom, right? Let's say there is a Lyman series uh, emission, 
and you know what is the what should be the wavelength of Lyman series photon. And uh, if if there is um, you observe the photon and it turns out that it is it is larger compared to the Lyman series because its wavelength has been stretched due to the expansion of the universe. The star has moved far away uh, from the time of the emission of the photon. This is called a cosmological redshift, and that actually can tell us almost very accurately what is the matter content of our universe and how it is expanding, what which rate. I mean, there has been, I mean, debate about uh, the exact values of the, let's say, the Hubble parameter or the expansion rate or the matter content, but there has been no doubt that the, about the fact that the universe is expanding. And that's how it is verified. Hubble actually verified this first time uh, in 1929. And Rice and Parmuter also observed this cosmological redshift. Uh, and yeah. <coughs> So here is, uh, I mean, uh, the main research topic, what I'm going to say. Uh, I will try to, I mean, how many of you are familiar with quantum field? The students? Okay, uh, I mean, let's uh, forget the- That's okay, yeah. 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 Okay, so, um, so what happens now? Uh, let's say there are massless particles in, in this uh, inflationary background. Okay. Uh, and they are, uh, they cannot be, they are not treated, they are not to be treated classically. They are quantum. Okay. Quantum fields means something relativistic and quantum. Okay. You are familiar with quantum mechanics and uh, things are not relativistic there. I'm speaking very roughly in a very naive manner. Uh, let's say there are something relativistic and their quantum. So you need some theory called quantum field theory. Okay. Um, quantum field theory is usually done in Minkowski background in flat space time. However, here we'll do quantum field theory in the inflationary background or in DC space time. Okay. So um, in a dynamical background like the DC by dynamical, I mean time dependent. It is expanding with acceleration, right? So there is something called particle pair creation. Particle pair creation means out of the vacuum, particle might come out. Okay. And gravity, enormous gravity that is there. It is expanding enormously. And uh, due to that, uh, the vacuum might decay. The ground state, which we call, and it might decay and it might create particles, pair creation. So vacuum decays? Yes. Decays to what? Particles? The vacuum decays to uh, some new vacuum. Uh -huh. uh, let's say there is some initial vacuum and it ends up at some sufficiently late time to some uh, okay. final vacuum. But uh, these two vacuums are different. So they would be related via some kind of squeeze state uh, relationship. So, I mean, if you see with respect to at late times, if you see want to see uh, uh, what is the particle number density with respect to your initial vacuum state, you will find the vacuum state, the state is not empty, there is a lot of particle as it came. Because the vacuum is not empty. It is something like, I mean, analogous to, let's say we have a harmonic oscillator, we have a ground state, and let's say that uh, some of the mass of the harmonic oscillator has been changed. It stays in the chain, there will be bubbling of kind of relationship, and there will be squeeze state kind of expansion relationship. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, this is always true for some, uh, some matter fields, except some matter fields which are conformally invariant. Conformally invariant is a technical term, it means it's, it's roughly related to scale invariance. But we are not talking about conformally invariant matter fields here, so we can just drop this down uh, in this seminar, forget about it. So massless, but not non-conformal fields, it means massless fields, which have zero rest masses, uh, and uh, they are not scale invariant, okay? Uh, photon does not fall into this category, because in three plus one, one dimensions, four dimensions, Photon is massless, it has no rest mass, but it is also conformally invariant. So <clears throat> it turns out, I mean, you can estimate 
You can see these papers also. I mean, I have not given the full detail, but if you want, I can give you the full uh, full reference. Um, this is a, a very wonderful review in this topic. It turns out that created such particles actually can have an infinite, practical infinite light time. And it indicates if those created particles have infinite light time, uh, it indicates that the quantum effects of any amplitude you wish to compute uh, can become very large. This HT, H, remember, is the Hubble rate, P is the cosmological time, HT is a dimensionless quantity, and HT must greater than 1 means T is very large. Any process, H is a constant, any process containing propagators of such field as internal lines, uh, there can be large quantum effects at late times, created by long wavelength or infrared um, modes, and this is called the secular effect. Uh, maybe uh, I'll tell you what what is actually uh, what is actually meant by that. Just a moment. Um, right yes, here. Yes. Right. Yeah. Suppose um, some something is flowing. Uh, some some particles or some quantum waves are flowing and they interact with each other, right? And they uh, go out. Okay. It turns out that during these interactions, uh, speaking once again very roughly, um, there are some particles uh, uh, created which are called virtual particles, which are not observables. And you need to sum over the energy and momentum of such virtual particles. Okay. And these are called loops. And uh, actually, this loop will play, these loops will play a very crucial role in this uh, in this talk. So here is the massless uh, scalar field. This is a Klein Gordon equation, right? Uh, I hope you are familiar with Klein Gordon equation. This is the this is a relativistic uh, uh, relativistic. Schrodinger equation, you might say, free for free particles. Well, uh, whatever I'm saying, very, very roughly. Okay, do not take them, uh, do not take them literally. Um, so this is the solution of uh, these uh, mode functions. K is the momentum, three momentum, k x, k y, k z, and uh, eta is the time coordinate. So initial uh, condition is this. Uh, eta is minus h inverse, and the modes are so see, the modes have certain wavelengths. Initially, universe was small, right? So modes were very small as well. The wavelengths, the universe then started accelerated expanding. So modes were stretched as well. So initially, the modes were ultraviolet, and as the time goes, due to the enormous expansion, the enormous stretching the wavelength of those modes becomes very large and they become infrared. Ultraviolet means small wavelength, infrared means very large wavelength. So this is our initial condition. Uh, so this looks like a uh, plane wave, right? Plane wave solution. And we actually co define our ground state here. Vacuum state here, and that is called the punch vacuum. And here is- uh, In this set of this is in Decida space time. Uh, I mean, if you do not take uh, Decida, there are possible Decida universes where the scale factor is not exactly exponential. Uh, you cannot do exact calculations there. So the Bunch day is vacuum uh, is, that, is the manifestation of Decida spectrum, or is it also, is it Bunch is made for Decida. Decida initial vacuum state is called Bunch Davis. After the, I mean, they actually discovered this. Uh, state um, and uh, here is something called uh, propagator let's forget about it and actually I'll roughly tell you what does a propagator mean a propagator actually denotes the propagation of a field from one point to another point without propagator we cannot do quantum field theory actually it describes how one one field the field is propagated in space time so um, so the solution of the propagator looks like this, forget about it once again. Uh, actually, <laughs> these parts needs to be kept. Otherwise, I mean, the message would be wrong. Uh, but actually, you can ignore these expressions. 
Okay. Uh, this this thing was calculated, for example, you can see this Brunier and uh, Unger's uh, paper. And um, uh, this this is a distance function, and this is a uh, visitor invariant. And um, what happens here for a massless scalar field, um, this propagator is not invariant under the situs symmetry transformations because of this law of AA prime term. <coughs> okay, and that actually creates this whole lot of things, whole lot of crazy things. It's a really A or A. A of t is a scale factor. So this is not invariant as you can see uh, under any symmetry transformation. This term. In fact, there exists no visitor invariant, visitor invariant two-point function, let's say Feynman propagator uh, for a massless scalar field, and also for a gravity. <coughs> so yeah, so um, let's see a simple example of this uh, outcome uh, of this of this thing. Um, let's say, I mean, there is something called interacting scalar field theory. Let's say lambda phi four theory. And there we calculate something called uh, something called the self-energy. And it turns out the self-energy looks like this. Okay, uh, the coincidence limit of propagator, you put x equal to x prime and you get this one. This is a divergence, epsilon equal to zero plus. That's how divergences are built in quantum field theory. Often the amplitudes in quantum field theory you calculate gives infinities. Okay, but infinities are not physical because we cannot measure anything. And what one does actually, uh, they actually redefine the Lagrangian, they introduce some new terms to cancel out these divergences. This process is called denormalization. And you see, this log of A is space-time dependent thing, time dependent thing, because A is the scale factor, it's a function of time. And there is a divergence. This divergence can be dealt with something called mass denormalizing counter term by redefining the mass of the scalar field. However, this thing, this log of A cannot be, cannot be actually absorbed. Problem is, this E of T is a monotonically increasing function, right? The universe is expanding with acceleration. Aren't we considering uh, visitor space and A should be just like exponential, right? It will be minus one. Yes. So A is like E to the power alpha T or H to the Yes. So e to the Even power that also has a problem. Huh? Even so if it's e to the power h t, so that LNA term I was just thinking. It is simply h t. H t. That is the e folding So but then you still have the issue of this is increasing monotonically. Okay. Monotonically with time. And I mean there is no perturbation theory because I mean this this term can grow unbounded. If t is very high. Then I mean this term, this self-energy, you know, self-energy is very high at late times. This is a non perturbative term. And this is called actually the secular term. Um, so people got inspired when actually uh, could understand this thing, observe this thing. And what was their idea? They said that well, we do not know. Uh, anything about this cosmic coincidence problem, right? The initial universe's lambda value uh, was very high, dark energy density was very high. Now it is very small. We do not know how actually it achieved its small value. And with this fine tuning, as I said, take plus minus 10% mismatch cannot be there. Either. So people said, well, let us use this massless scalar field, or even there will be issues of gravitons as, as well. But let's talk, only talk about, uh, let's not focus about quantum gravity here. Let's only talk about uh, scalar field here. So um, they say that, well, could it be possible that these large quantum effects actually uh, breaks the de Sitter symmetry at late times and the de Sitter space is changed to some other space, other space time. So that, um, I mean, the inflation ends and I mean it screens the inflationary high value of lambda and all this. Um, similar loop effects have been computed for Inkawa coupling, quantum electrodynamics, <laughs> scalar, and gravitons up to two loops. 
uh, will, but this is not actually the case. Turns out that these uh, things actually, these are non-perturbative effects, and if I actually can sum the perturbation theory in some manner, that is called resummation in quantum field theory, one can show that things become finite. It's, it's something like this. Let's say I give you a function e to the power minus x, and x goes to infinity. You know it is going to zero, which is perfectly finite. However, I give you the first couple of terms of this series, e to the power minus x. Let's say 1 minus x plus x square over 2 minus x cube over 3 and up to this. And let's, let me ask you this, that suppose you are given this series, you do not know it is an exponential series. I mean, I'm talking from the point of view of this problem. And let's say that I give you a series like this, first couple of terms, and I ask you, if x goes to infinity, what happens? What is the value of this series? You'll say this is a divergent thing. Okay, this cannot have any finite value. But if you know how to sum this series, you know this is this gives you something called e to the power minus x. And this is actually vanishing. So it's hell and heaven difference, right? Something if you look into only the individual terms in the perturbation series, you find you conclude that something is very large, divergent or very large, but if you know how to sum those terms, you conclude that no, this is actually not divergent. Even though the individual terms are divergent, they sum up, they conspire with each other in such a way that the whole thing is vanishing. So, can I ask you a question? Sure. So, you are asking, so in this scenario, the only word yeah. from the two scenarios, you are saying that it's the back reaction of the resetter symmetry breaking that is actually having a spinning effect on the large lambda and inflation in the middle. Yes. Is it the same scenario when we talked about slow? So this is uh, because you know if you think of an inflationary potential and we talk about slow roll inflation, and there there is a natural way to think of inflation ending. Mm -hmm. Are these two connected or this is just a space time effect? Uh, yes, so these two are not connected are not because connected. the standard textbook descriptions yeah. of the slow roll kind of stuff, yeah. they are entirely classical description. And in order to, uh, if you want to explain this uh, plus minus 10 percent kind of, uh, I mean, this cosmic coincidence problem, as I say, that your lambda has to be, your dip of this potential has to have that much value so that this kind of finite feeling is happening. I mean, this seems somewhat unsatisfactory. So, this you are saying that also simultaneously uh, sort of answers the question that why can we have a very small uh, no, it lambda? Doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. People had this idea that it might. <coughs> that is the question. Uh, that is the point. And they say that these are very large things. Okay. So, they might, if I substitute them back in the Einstein equations, they might create large back reactions. So that uh, we have lost the computer in bad things. That is the that is the point. That is what that was their idea. But the point is, it is something similar to this exponential series. If I go to this is two loop calculation. If I go to next loop, three loop, I will have something which is also divergent, and that will even dominate the one loop theory compared to the standard perturbation theory. And if I some way can resum, this is not easy thing. Uh, resummation in quantum field theory is another, uh, I mean, uh, complicated stuff. But if I some way can resum them, it turns out that this rho of lambda as a uh, of t goes to infinity has something finite. So the de Sitter symmetry is not actually broken. The de Sitter symmetry is actually retained. That is the point. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, why, I mean, maybe I have missed the point. Why we are giving so much stress on Dissiter symmetry? Uh, because Dissiter is accelerated expansion. Mm -hmm. Dissiter means accelerated expansion. Uh, if I want to uh, end the inflation, mm -hmm. okay, somehow I need to um, screen the inflationary lambda value so that the other matters, right, radiation, mm -hmm. like the cold dark matter, they start dominating the lambda. So and this, this may be treated as an alternative approach to that what people generally no, do. No, that is, uh, no, reheating comes later. 
really I mean, comes later. I mean, um, it's I mean actually towards the end of inflation. So uh, uh, these are going to uh, I mean uh, basically determine the background geometry. That, that's what. Yeah, the metric will be changed if I if I generate change. large back reactions. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are I mean. If I want to uh, create accelerated expansion mm -hmm. or digital like accelerated expansion, this rho must be constant. It's cosmological constant. But if rho is uh, lamp log square a, it is time dependent. It is not digital. It is something else. In other words, it screens the inflationary lambda, which is pre existing yet, so that there is radiation. Uh, it can start dominating the inflationary lambda and we can enter. Uh, this radiation dominated era, and then we can enter this full dark matter domination. The standard, uh, I mean, this textbook uh, description of how inflation could have ended, they lack any anything quantum, anything microscopic, and that is too much fine tuned. And the standard things do not address this problem of cosmological this fine tuning problem, this cosmic coincidence problem or cosmological constant problem. Why lambda is so small today? What we observe today. Uh, sorry, I mean maybe I also missed the thing, but I think we do there are two different things. One is that why is inflation ending? That's a question. Yeah. And the other question is why is the cosmological constant value so low at the present universe? Yeah, they they right? actually relate. Yes, so in this scenario, you are saying that these two questions probably can can be simultaneously answered because there is uh, you know, violation of the decentral symmetry, as you are saying, and there is screening of lambda. Yes. And so the lambda is suppressed, and that also gives the material reason why it's present today, as well as why the value of lambda should, could be low uh, in yes. the current period. Yes. Probably that scenario is different from the standard scenario, as we understand. There, I don't think ending of inflation has a problem, I mean, in the floral picture. So but that is no, no, no. That, that is not a problem because that is I mean that is you just, are saying that the description is not fundamental. That is there is there is nothing microscopical there. Even even if one wants to talking about the scalar field rolling, yes. in that case, why isn't it quantum mechanical? That is purely classical. That is purely classical. Well, yes. what uh, gives you the accelerated expansions, that is purely classical. You have this energy momentum yes, tensor. Yes, the energy momentum. How pi square? Classical is called the classical. So you just have a, you just have the Lagrangian. You have just ignored the uh, you know, the pi star is very low. So yes. you have just the energy momentum tensor. Yes. That is the yes. The pi star is very low. Yes. 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 Y
Yeah. Uh, and uh, to write all these things, we are considering the background is curved and field is quantum. Yes. Uh, I mean, there has been attempts to understand what will happen if the background is reseated and there are quantum gravitational fluctuations. I mean, uh, gravitons mm -hmm. there. But the issue of uh, this infrared gravitons in this theater is an open question. I mean, there has been lots of, uh, I mean, there are lots of understand to uh, understand regarding the other fields, simpler fields like scalar, fermions, or gauge fields mm -hmm. as well. And however, this graviton can also give rise to this kind of secular effect because gra gravitons have zero risk mass and they are not conformally invariant. Uh, but the issue of IR gravitons in this theater is uh, just an open issue. Because, I mean, uh, there is no unique this in interacting Lagrangian, right? If you want to do quantum gravity, automatic quantum gravity, you can expand it to infinite order. But then, once again, uh, one can ask that uh, gravity cannot be quantized perturbatively, so why one should be interested in this? So the answer is that, well, we are not uh, trying to say that perturbative quantum gravity will be solved in this theater can be solved because it cannot be solved in Minkowski space time. We are only talking about the IR part of these gravitons and whether they can be resummed in some manner. That is the thing, but this is an open issue. <coughs> so the answer is negative. I mean, to what Omni Woodard and many other people thought uh, in those days. Actually, it was shown uh, recently in 2019, uh, this uh, is a PRL paper, uh, that actually you can sum this series. Okay, you can resum this series. And so that the Zeta symmetry is written at late times. So you cannot uh, kill this capital lambda in this. Okay, in a, in a, in a considerable, in any considerable line. However, the secular effect has other interesting aspects. Uh, and as I said, that gravitons can also generate these things. Whether a graviton, inflationary infrared gravitons can screen, uh, can or cannot screen this capital lambda is an open question and that needs to be answered. Uh, but we have no clue yet how to answer this question. However, uh, uh, this secular effect, this non perturbative secular effect, have other interesting predictions. Uh, that is the dynamical generation of mass. I mean, it turns out, even though the scalar field is massless to begin with, it can actually generate some, it can have some mass. Uh, it dy mass can be dynamically generated towards the end of the integration. And that can leave interesting footprints in the CMB. And that can tell us about the, uh, by observations, that can tell us about the geometry of the early inflationary universe and what kind of matter fields was there, present there in those times. We should also uh, keep in your mind that during inflation, there was no atoms. Atoms formed later. So things were fundamental matter fields. Okay. Um, so there is another formulation of this inflationary dynamics, and that is called the stochastic formalism, stochastic field theory. Uh, this is a probabilistic formalism also, and this is related to something called Langevin equation, hocker plant equation, and uh, and uh, we can also demonstrate similar effects for some particle detectors. These are called unrooted particle detectors, and near a black hole event horizon, and there are, as I said, the field, even though the field is uh, massless to begin with, it can be massive towards the end of inflation very strong quantum fluctuations, provided you can do this resummation uh, of self energies. And this can leave interesting predictions in CMB, cosmic microwave background, with the first light coming from the early universe, primordial gravitational waves, and non dual stability. And as I said, solving gravitons or gauge field couplings in GS is a, I mean, uh, very much an issue uh, because, I mean, there are even the how to fix the gauge is not very clear. The gauge condition. Okay, um, so let me give you some brief idea um, what I have been doing in this since the last couple of years. Uh, so now the quartic potential 
is positive. And it yields a positive non perturbative vacuum expectation value of this potential. Uh, and actually, it indicates that since this can be resumed, the uh, in increase in the inflationary lambda value. Uh, for for non-positive potentials, we might find it in this. Knowing the precise shift is actually important. So um, I started with this. So I thought that let us take this potential. Okay. Um, this one. This lambda is positive, and this is uh, most well studied in this heater. Lambda pi 4 by capital. Factorial 4, those will do quantum field theory, they will also study this pi 4 uh, potential. Uh, I thought that let us add a cubic potential. The sign of beta is, uh, it can be either positive or negative, doesn't matter. However, this phi 4 is symmetric under phi 2 minus phi. This potential is not symmetric under phi 2 minus phi. This is a symmetric potential. And it looks like this. Now you see that this potential can become negative. It has a minima and it can become negative. So the idea is, let us fix our initial condition like this. Let us say that the system is located here at the initial time. Around this flat plateau, uh, at around phi equal to zero. So that perturbation theory is valid. Initially, the potential is very small. And let's, I mean, we quantize the field here. This is the bunch Davis vacuum. Massless minimal scalar field, minimally coupled. There is no non minimal coupling with curvature. And uh, we release it here. Let it evolve with time. Uh, I mean, obviously, it will try to roll down towards the minimum. Right. Now, this is a very standard problem. It might appear that it is a very standard problem. Um, I mean, so what is the big deal here? However, the point is while it is rolling down, it is a dynamical problem. We cannot just have this classical minima. This classical minima is located at minus 3 beta, 5 equals minus 3 beta by lambda. You might expect that the field at sufficient delay times will be located at 5 equal to minus 3 beta by lambda as of flat space time, and there would be some quantum fluctuations over there. But this is not the case. Because there are strong quantum fluctuations, this potential, the shape of this potential, while the field is rolling down, due to radiative corrections would change, right? So we need to understand that what is the minima of this potential. And also this minima needs to be evaluated, this minimum value. Note that this potential's minima is, I mean, just you can calculate the extrema of this potential. It will turn out that the minima is located as minus three beta by lambda. And this depends upon the ratio, actually, of beta by lambda. So even if this beta is small and lambda is small, their ratio can be very large, right? So if the value of this vacuum expectation value of phi, um, in flat space time, one would expect that at late times, it will be like this, plus some quantum fluctuations. Here, it will be not, that's what I'm, I'm going to show. So however, this value, what it suggests a priori, that if beta by lambda is large, even though beta and lambda are individually small values, this uh, phi's value at late times can be very large. And that can create some kind of back reaction. Okay, some considerable back reaction. Okay, so let us see. And it can be negative value. And that negative value of phi would be very important because lambda is positive. That might lead to some kind of screening. Okay, um, yeah, I have explained this thing, you forget it. It's the energy momentum tensor, that's what I, that it's vacuum expectation value I'm trying to calculate. That that would give us, I mean, what is the vacuum reaction? Um, yet one thing is that in dynamical background, like the deceiver, the initial vacuum, as I said, evolves, and it is not stable, it decays into some final vacuum state, and computing expectation values using standard uh, this in-out S matrix elements. This is the standard quantum field theory. Um, uh, it is not very meaningful, and one needs something called the in-in or closed time path formalism, 
And uh, here, I mean, this is some other issue we can discuss about it. Only thing is that this requires four propagators. Instead of having fine man, we have two <laughs> white man green functions, white man functions, and one anti fine man functions. So something propagates uh, forward in time, and then comes backward. So really something is not coming backward. Uh, only thing is that, only difference here is that in cosmology, and flat space time is, uh, is this, that in flat space time, the interactions are occurring in very small region of space and time. Imagine an electron is coming, hitting some hydrogen atom, and it is going away. Initially, the electron was free. Finally, the electron is free. Okay, the interaction is taking place at very small region of space time. And that's why the states are free, taken to be free. Uh, however, in cosmology, we do not have such kind of freedom. If there is interaction, it is, it is there always. Second thing is that we do not have large times, right? Our universe has finite age. And this inflation is having taking place between some finite time interval. So the techniques are different here. And we, we need to use some non-equilibrium technique for the swinger tailings of any close time path. Anyway, um, uh, so we calculated, I calculated this uh, T minimum at two loop. Uh, this is some counter term. Yeah, this is the thing. Uh, forget it. This is the late time thing. If you take it uh, at late times. So you see there is a log Q here. Okay. And uh, if you take the, want to calculate the energy density, just put mu equal to t, mu equal to t, you have g0, 0, which is negative. So you have negative energy density. Right. Um, well, uh, now I'm mostly interested to calculate what is the expectation value of this phi here. And I needed to calculate these diagrams and renormalize them. These are called tag poles in quantum field theory. And um, as you can see, it is given by the logarithm of the scale factor. Uh, let's forget these things. And uh, this is the result of the two loop. And uh, um, so here, if I actually, I was able to reach some this result, this uh, result by constructing some kind of differential equation. Uh, let's not go into them, uh, into the detail of it. And it turns out the expected, the most, the thing I wish to emphasize here, the vacuum expectation value of this field at sufficiently late times is minus 4.4781 beta by lambda compared to its classical minimum value. So you can see the things how much different compared to the flat space time. In flat space time, things you would expect it falls down to the minima or in the standard uh, picture of slow roll inflation. But you see that, that the minima, this average thing, average value has changed now. And it is changed by order of magnitude almost. Okay, so uh, I estimated its back reaction now and um, it, it turns out that if this ratio, beta bar is some dimensionless quantity, it's beta divided by the Hubble rate, is order 10 or order 10 to the power 2, 2 or order 10 to the power 3, then, I mean, there is a considerable back reaction on this inflationary lambda value, and it could be 20%, 30% even. So, I mean, once again, I'm saying, talking about the ratio of them. I'm not saying beta bar is large or lambda is large or something like this. For example, we can individually take beta bar to be, let's say, 10 to the power minus 6, lambda to be, let's say, 10 to the power minus 9. Then you, this beta bar by lambda ratio is 10 to the power 3. This ratio is large then. And actually, this means a very large value of this phi average. Right? And if this phi average is large, it can create a large back reaction. And it is negative if beta is taken to be positive. And actually, actually, that can lead to considerable back reaction to the inflationary cosmological constant. Okay, uh, then we computed pi squared average, and um, 
calculated this dynamical mass. So see, this field has no mass. Scalar field has no mass to begin with. And at sufficiently late times, we can actually show that this mass is generated by some kind of resummation of two-point correlation functions. And this is a non-perturbative result, as you can see. And uh, so, yeah. So here is the emphasis that why uh, things are different here. Once again, uh, one would expect that the mass is given by the double derivative of the potential at minima, standard classical mechanics problem that, let's say, a potential V of x, it has a minima at x equal to x0, and if the uh, if the particle, if a particle is located around x equal to x0, you can expand V of x around x0, the term is, reading term is harmonic, V double prime x0, then x minus x0 square, and you can associate a mass. Uh, with V double prime X zero, but things are different here. And you see, this is the actual mass, and this has nothing to do with the classical ideas. So this I this problem I did with Nitin Joshi is uh, was a PhD student at IIT. Uh, he has now defended. And further uh, investigations, I'm working with a PhD student Kim Shukura. At Jadhapur University. Uh, I mean, we try to develop something called a non perturbative Schwinger Dyson equation in this scenario. Um, and these are the scheme resummation. I mean, if you have any question, you can go into the discussion of it. But let's keep it. These are called daisy diagrams. This is the, this thing. It's the way of resumming, one way of resumming things. Uh, actually, presently, we are trying to constrain this beta bar by lambda ratio from CAG uh, uh, with uh, um, Sudesh Kumar, who is another PhD student of mine at IIT. Um, and uh, we're trying to do this thing by observing uh, this correlation data uh, and some non the data of non Gaussianity uh, available in the literature. And also, actually, with Shudesh, I was able to uh, resum the vertex functions uh, for a scalar field. This is in the communication. And uh, recently, we generalized this thing for mm -hmm. Yukawa interactions. So these are the equations we considered. These are vacuum expectation values. And we calculated these expectation values up to three loop and resum this thing to find this analytic result for phi average. If you said G is the Yukawa coupling, and if you said G goes to zero, we reproduce our earlier result for phi average. <laughs> and also for this two-point correlation function, and uh, uh, yeah, and outlook, we are now working with uh, this to construct non-perturbative effective potentials, uh, which are, which are actually, which contains this full infrared effects to study this reading towards the end of inflation for various inter interactions and um, this IR graviton. So, uh, first, maybe we can look into this lambda root determinant G term and uh, I mean, they're affecting decoherence. Some initial ideas can be seen in this work. Okay, so thank you very much for your kind attention. I've just tried to give you some idea. Uh, I have not gone, believe me, I have not gone into any technicalities. But if you want uh, to go into the one to go into that, please feel free to ask me. Okay, questions? There were quite a few questions during the talk. There are other questions? Okay, yes. So, let, so let's say, can we go to a potential, the lambda I4 and Yeah, I see. I see. So what, what sort of motivated you to use potential? Yeah. They say that, well, let us accept that what people initially thought that uh, this one uh, will create large back reaction 
to screen the inflationary gland doesn't work. It leaves some space. Okay. So, uh, so now if I take the vacuum expectation value of lambda phi 4 by factorial 2, since lambda is a positive quantity and phi 4 is a positive operator, its expectation value with respect to any state will be positive definite quantities. Now, if I have this lambda in Einstein's equation and add a expectation value of V of phi, that will now will generate a positive number. Lambda is positive, add a positive number with it. So it enhances actually the cosmological constant because of the symmetry restoration in the non perturbative So I added this one to break this phi goes to minus phi symmetry. And uh, well, I do not expect, even if I, there is no reason to expect that, uh, I mean, this will create uh, a very large back reaction in the way people were thinking initially, the decider making large back reaction. So the idea of adding this thing was to make this potential non-positive. This potential has a minima which is negative. Here we have five negative. So fix the initial condition here, where I have this bunch Davis vacuum initially. Now it will roll down. I cannot treat this thing classically. That initially this thing is this. So initially phi is zero. Finally phi must be this one. So let us substitute this value at with, uh, with P of phi and estimate what is the back reaction. But that is not the case. I hope I have been able to convey. Yeah, so, 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 can I ask this question? Is that, if, so to create a you know, create a screen of the lambda, that is the goal that you are saying that it's starting from there and going to a hmm. lower value and that's like a negative thing that you are, you are just cancelling the lambda value. So then the reason I ask this question is that is the the most normal, the first step uh, toward trying to answer this question is to add a phi cube term or, the, or are there other ways where you can reduce the value of lambda? Yeah. Having so the phi cube. For example, the other way could be to add a uh, fermionic interaction, but uh, for with fermionic interaction, whether it can uh, generate so, so this uh, is a fermionic interaction with the scalar field. Side by side phi, it's our kind of interaction. Okay, so as I said, we are working on these effective potentials now. So we'll be able to perhaps answer that whether it is possible or not. Here, the I mean, uh, one thing is this beta by lambda ratio. Yeah, that often it turns out. Often it turns out things are directly proportional to beta, or things are directly proportional to some coupling constant. But the coupling constant, if you want to have this perturbation theory to be valid initially, they has to be taken small, taken to be small, order unity or less than order unity. Here we have this freedom of taking both these coupling constants to be extremely small and yet to generate a large number. That was the point. And then we have this dynamical mass, uh, yeah, that... and that actually. Uh, that actually can uh, create the correlation functions would be changed. Uh, of this, this scale invariance of correlation functions, they would have some kind of effect. And that from there, we can try to understand whether uh, the value of beta by lambda, beta by, beta by lambda is allowed or not, or how much they are allowed. Other questions? But yes, once again, I would like to emphasize for gravitons, we do not know. Maybe it is possible the gravitons can screen the inflationary lambda. Yeah, that's, the that's a different story. Yeah, no. okay. Okay. Uh, can you give to the estimates uh, where you use R less than <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so these values are from uh, CMD? Yes, I have taken this uh, from somewhere. Yeah, these are less than 0.0. It must be the plant. Yeah. So, this is the plant. Yeah. So, uh, I should have cited the. Yeah, now my question is that, um, I mean, oh. When from a theory, mm. we match with the CMD results. 
So whatever R or R is the tensor to scalar ratio. Ratio, right. So there we uh, check the tensor to scalar perturbations normally. So here, how that has been done? That that is something that I cannot follow. No, here we have not taken tensor. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, perturbations or scalar perturbation. We have not perturbed the matrix here. Okay, so where we are using R then? Uh, just to estimate what could be the value of this H, the numerical value of this inflationary hubble. But are you using perturbation? Yeah, I think look at the gravitational wave, right? The mm. So it's effectively the component of gravitational waves, which is the tensor fluctuations. Yeah. And then compared to the temperature fluctuations, which is the scalar, this actually we always consider fluctuations of of uh, either the, the, the power spectrum we first generate, yeah. and then we uh, take the ratio. Mm -hmm. Then we match with theory and observation. Mm -hmm. So that is my question. That here, how? Here we are just taking the numerical value of h from from this from this thing. Uh, we are just trying to estimate how what should be the value of this Hubble rate given the inflation. That's it. So that depends on the scalar tensor ratio. Yeah, uh, that's what I I uh, got. Because h, you write h, 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 this is the I didn't rate. calculate this thing. Actually, mm -hmm. I, I got this thing from someone, from literature. I can tell you the reference actually. Uh, it's it, it's with me in the in my laptop. In the paper I have cited where I have written this expression. I, yeah, I have this not scale is uh, normally determined by this, but that is that depends on the theory. It does not change things even if we forget this thing. The inflationary Hubble rate should be 10 to the power around 10 to the power minus 5 times the Planck mass, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So yes. it doesn't change things. It, the order of magnitude will not change. So mm -hmm. you are saying that if even this is the Hubble value, then yes. what is the yes? What is the it, how much thing me, can you add? Yes, it gives me an upper bound yeah. because of this of H. However, it should be around 10 to the power minus 5 times the Planck mm -hmm. mass. So that's the observational constant. Yes. So it has to be, it has to match that. So that's how you are doing it. Other questions? If not, then I may have questions. So one is, uh, so this may be naive, uh, but let me ask it anyway. Uh, one is that in that uh, beta phi cube by three factor that you took. So instead of that, if you took just five or five to the power five. Will that uh, change things uh, dramatically or? Five to the power 